Historically, the book of Romans has had an incredible impact at critical points in the history of the church. And one of the most important reasons that that is so is because the theme, the essence of the book of Romans is the grace of God. Satan hates the grace of God. This is a subject that is so contrary to human nature. It is very difficult to understand. To understand what God's grace means is to understand something that's totally revolutionary to human thought. Because grace is God giving us at Christ's expense everything that we can never deserve or earn. In fact, I often teach the word grace by using the first, the acrostic of the word, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. But the book of Romans defines what grace is and why God can give it. And so this has been a book that Satan has particularly hated. And last night I reviewed church history all the way from the time of the apostles to modern times. I just did a quick run through of an outline of all church history. And you know, it brought back to my memory the years that I spent studying church history. And right after the age of the apostles, at the beginning of the second century, you begin to see a sad development begin to take root in the church at large. The grace of God began to be obscured almost immediately after the death of the apostles. Certain documents that are key to, uh, to understanding the history of the church in those earliest centuries, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth century, like the Shepherd of Hermes, this is a famous document written by early church fathers, so-called. In this book, you see that they understood about the crucifixion of Christ and that faith in Christ brought salvation, but you see that they understood very little more than that because it taught a kind of a legalism, like you somehow had to work to keep yourself saved. And the epistle of Barnabas was another document, and many of the writings of the church fathers, you see how progressively as the church went away from the early teachings of the apostles, that grace increasingly became obscured and the church plunged increasingly into a growing darkness until in the fourth century, Constantine in 325 AD married the church to the state. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Many thought that this was a blessing, but it turned out to be a curse. The church became institutionalized. The legalism, traditions of men began to be woven in with the scripture so that the grace of God was almost completely obscured. The Holy Spirit had to work outside of the official ministry and the official institution of the church for anyone to understand how they could truly know the grace of God and live in the freedom that Christ gave us through his death in our place. And it got worse from that time until in the sixth century, the church became known as the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Now, I don't mean that in the sense that you have today. It meant the universal church under the control of Rome. The bishop of Rome, through a process that went over a period of about 150 years, began to claim primacy over all other bishops of other cities. And the leadership and control of the church became centralized into one seat of power and that was under the Bishop of Rome. 
and he began to be known as the Pope. History itself tells us that from the period of 590 to 1517 A.D., it was called what? What were those ages called? The Dark Ages. Now, why were they called the Dark Ages? Because the scriptures were shut up from the common people. But there was something even worse. The grace of God had been completely obscured by the professional ministry. The mass became known as a re-crucifixion of Christ. They began to sell indulgences so that you could actually purchase forgiveness for sin by paying a penance. And this extended even to after death, where the teaching of purgatory began to be taught. That, that is, that if you didn't quite make it in this life, you could pay things off in the next life. Maybe sweat it out in a hot place called purgatory for a few thousand years. And then that became a very lucrative basis of making money for the church because they used to go around and say, think about your poor relatives who are suffering in purgatory. If you buy an indulgence, you can get them some time off and get them out sooner. Imagine, can you imagine the horror and the anguish that people were in? St. Peter's Basilica and all the great works of art in Rome were built primarily with money raised through going around selling indulgences. It was the dark ages because the grace of God had been locked up. The church had been plunged into darkness. There were refreshing outbreaks of light at various times during this awful long period of darkness. People like Huss, who started the Moravian Brethren in Bohemia. Count Louis von Zinzendorf of Germany, who took the Moravians in and started, he had a, he had a great, uh, a great uh, spread of land. And so he took these people who were being so persecuted, who were true believers, he took them in and he started a great conference ground where these people live called Hernhut in Germany. But Huss was burned at the stake. Why? Because he defied the priestcraft of the day, because he turned to the scriptures, and because he proclaimed the grace of God. Wycliffe in England found the grace of God. He was banished. Many, many others were tortured to death. Why? Because in the midst of that darkness, they were a ray of light, and they brought about the grace of God. Do you know how blessed you are here today to understand the grace of God? Do you understand how many hundreds of years, how many millions of people have not been able to hear the grace of God clearly taught? I'm not magnifying myself. I was taught the grace of God. I consider myself a blessed person because as a young believer under Bob Thiem of Houston, Texas, I learned the grace of God and expanded upon it after that. But the grace of God was something that was obscured and people died for believing it during that dark, dark period. But there came a time in the, fifth, the end of the 15th century when there was a man who had already received a master's degree at the University of Erfurt in Germany. His close friend died. And this man had a great deal of problems with guilt anyway, and he was trying to cover his sense of guilt by studying humanities. But when his close friend died, he became very appalled about his condition and uh, his sense of, he knew there was a God, but he was afraid of God because he knew that he fell far short of this holy God. And so he 
joined the Augustinian order after the death of his dear friend. He became an Augustinian monk, but during his days of training in uh, the, uh, the monastery, the Augustinian monastery, he began to learn the Greek scripture. This man had a photographic memory and he began to master the Greek New Testament particularly. And early on in his training, a man named John Staupitz, who had been influenced by the Moravian Brethren, you see how those little outbreaks of light down through church history would be caught by someone and carried on, even in that darkness. But a man named John Staupitz in that monastery began to talk to this young man studying to be an Augustinian monk. And he told him, look, the true light for coming to Christ and understanding the Word of God, I mean, understanding how to relate to God, is in the Scripture. And so he taught him to love the Scripture above the traditions of the church. This man was ordained to the Augustinian order of uh, monks, in 1507 A.D., and he was posted to teach at the University of Wittenberg. But he still was tormented by his sense of guilt, and it seemed that nothing he did could assuage the great sense of inadequacy that he felt toward God. So finally, the monast uh, the the head of the Augustinian order in Germany sent him on a mission to Rome in 1511. And it was while he was there in Rome observing the wonders and the beauties of the art treasures of the church. They thought this would give him a sense of, of certainty about his relationship with God, to see the, the great material order and structure of the church and its great lasting prestige, but it was while he was there doing an act of penance, which they call an indulgence, crawling on his knees for great distance over cobblestone streets, and only to finish at the, the place where ultimate, uh, ultimate penance was done. It was called the Scala Santa, a church that had 28 steps that went up to the entrance. And as this Augustinian monk, his knees bleeding from having crawled on the cobblestone streets through Rome in penance, as he was crawling up those steps and he got about midway up the steps, the Spirit of God brought back very powerfully a portion of the book of Romans that he had been diligently studying for some time. And he reported that suddenly he looked up and he saw as written in fire across the sky, the just shall live by faith. And in that moment, the Reformation was born because that Augustinian monk's name was Martin Luther. And as he finished crawling up those steps, he realized that with all of the tradition of a thousand years he would be going against, with all of the power of the church, he could no longer stand with what they were teaching. You, can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine how fearful that was? Listen, to come against the official doctrines of the church in those days meant you came under the Inquisition, where you could be tortured to death on the rack, where at the very least you would be put to death and burned at the stake. To be able to come from having been steeped in all of those traditions and told that this is the truth this is the way to God. And then suddenly to break loose from all of that 
and on the basis of the naked word of God to say it's all wrong. What has been taught for a thousand years is wrong. And to stand against it as one man, that takes something else. But thank God, over a period of months, Martin Luther began to diligently study the Scripture again. And finally, he came to a point where one of the emissaries of Rome came to his area in Wittenberg. They started selling indulgences there. That is that you, you could even, they were trying to raise money to finish a new facet of the church in Rome. And they were teaching that not only could you buy an indulgence that would cause you forget or purchase you forgiveness for sins you had already committed, but you could buy an indulgent on account of sins you hadn't committed yet. And that was the last straw with Martin Luther, a bull of a man, a man with indomitable will that came through his faith in God. He went to the gate of the castle church and he nailed there 95 theses that took direct issue with the main teaching of the whole church. And he challenged anyone to come and debate him on those 95 theses. No one took up the debate. But he became a hunted man. But he stuck with what he had learned about the grace of God. Because you know something? We are satiated with freedom here. We take for granted our freedoms here. We take for granted that we know the Word of God. Many of you were raised in homes where the Scripture was always available. Some of you even heard the grace of God as you grew up. And you don't realize that there are people who came out of darkness to understand it and knew that it was the only thing in life worth dying for, and they died for it. They put themselves on the line for it. And Martin Luther put his life on the line, and thank God he did, or we'd still be in darkness today, perhaps. But he was taken before a tribunal, and cardinals went through a very vigorous inquisition of his beliefs. But they could not refute what he said. Martin Luther could quote from memory whole passages of Scripture from the Greek text. And he could quote from memory whole passages of the official doctrines of the church and show point by point where the Scripture directly contradicted it. And so light broke into the church again, and it was because of the book of Romans. It was the book of Romans that showed Martin Luther that he had to stand against the whole world. In fact, at his tribunal, he said that he could not go against conscience. And then he said those immortal words, Here I stand. My conscience is bound by the word of God. God help me. Amen. That was his final defense. Well, God saved him. But after almost 200 years, the message of the grace of God began to wane again. And once again, Satan was beginning to darken the world away from understanding the grace of God. And nearly 200 years later, a young student from Oxford University in England went to the wild country called Georgia in the New World to be a missionary to the Indians. He and his brother were missionaries to the Indians in Georgia for two years but they became utterly frustrated because not only were they not successful at converting Indians to Christ, 
they realized, especially one of them realized, that he himself was not sure of where he stood with God. He was not sure of his own salvation. He constantly was plagued by guilt. And he had been taught by the church that you could lose your salvation, indeed, that you could rarely even know whether you were saved or not. And so after two frustrating years, this young man returned to London. And there, he was very devout, by the way. This young man started what they called the Holy Club at Oxford when he was there, and they were seeking God. I mean, he was a man who had a passion for God, but he'd had no assurance or no peace with God at all. He and his brother and a man named George Whitfield were part of this holy club. But when this young man came back from the colonies in Georgia, defeated and frustrated, he had heard while he was at Oxford about a group called the Moravian Brethren. And he heard they were having a Bible class in London, so he went to attend it. And they were reading that night Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans where Martin Luther expounded what the theme of the book of Romans was. That is that salvation is by faith alone plus nothing, which is the essence of the grace of God. And as they went through reading what Martin Luther had written 200 years before, this tortured young man with a passion for God said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And all of a sudden I knew that Jesus Christ was my Savior. And I knew that he would never let me go. For the first time he had assurance of his own salvation. And that man started an evangelism wave, a, a renaissance of the spirit that swept across England, Scotland, even into Ireland, but especially into the New World. That man's name was John Wesley. But once again, he was touched by the purest expression of God's message, which is in the book of Romans. The book of Romans has constantly had a great impact on the church at critical times in history. And that's why I've chosen at this time to teach it because what I teach here although this is a very very precious and important flock to me to be a shepherd here is is a is a real joy to my heart but I realize that what I teach here will go out through tapes and even videotapes to the world and once again the world is in desperate need to understand the grace of the living God, which he purchased at the cost of the blood of his own son. And once again, we have people making that which cost God everything expensive. You can only approach God by understanding that you have nothing by which you can gain his acceptance. There's only one thing we can do, and that's come to him realizing that God is so perfect that we can never by any amount of energy or pursuit or desire be good enough for him to accept because we have to be as good as he is to be accepted with a holy God. And then to realize that this God, who is so perfect, loved us so much that he stepped out of eternity into time and became a man in the Messiah, Jesus he was predicted for long centuries to come, and he came. And he bore the wrath of a holy God against our sins. And by doing that, God himself removed the problem of his own justice by paying his own penalty. And then he made free to us a forgiveness that can only be received by faith. Now, you know why? because faith is the one thing that a human being can do and still not do anything. 
because faith is the complete absence of human merit. Faith is receiving a gift. Faith is receiving the work that another has done for you. It is an, a, true faith is an admission that you cannot do anything to help yourself. You are helping, you're, you're leaning upon the work of another. These are the themes of the book of Romans, and it's set in very clear terms. Now let's look at the book of Romans. Here is a book that has started avalanches of change in history before. Let's see if God will do it again, okay? I want you to covenant with me to begin to study this book with me, to begin to read it with me, to begin to ask God to teach it to you so that you can share it with others. Because I believe we who understand the grace of God need to be realized that we are debtors to others to share that good news with them. All right, beginning with verse 1. Paul, a bondservant, of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. But every word in the scripture, especially in the writings of Paul, has very great meaning. The very word Paulus in the Greek, Paul, has great meaning to us. Because you see, in that day, when a Jew became a believer in Jesus, he adopted, as well as his Hebrew name, he adopted a name to be, so he could roam through the Roman world. So they would also have to have a Roman name. Paul chose his own name. You know what Paulus means? the least, little one, or the least. And so when Paul adapted a new name, his original name was Saul, which was Sheol, or a very honored name in Hebrew, which meant the praying one. It's a very pious name. But when he became a believer in Jesus and took on another name to be known in the Roman world, he he chose the name the least. Now, why did he do that? Because, you see, the Apostle Paul, of all of the apostles, understood the grace of God the most because he was, by his own declaration, and he made that declaration under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, I am the chief of sinners. I'm the worst. Hold your place here. And turn with me uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Now, there are a lot of people I've met who say, well, I'm sure that I'm the greatest sinner God ever saved. Well, let me tell you something. That may be true in this age, but the greatest one that's ever been saved has already been saved. According to the Word of God, Paul was the worst that the Lord ever had to forgive. And you know why? Was it because he led women and children, as well as men who were Christians, to be put to death because of their Christianity? Many think so. But I don't think so, because you know there have been others that have killed a lot more Christians than Paul did. Nero, some of the Caesars, killed more Christians than he did. Or just come to modern times, Mao Zedong wiped out virtually all Christians in China when he took over and slaughtered millions. But 
I believe the reason that Paul was the greatest sinner who ever lived is because he was the most religious man that probably ever lived. There was no one who was more devoutly religious than Paul before his salvation. He was so zealous, as we read in Philippians chapter 3, he was so zealous to excel in his pursuit of God under Judaism that he had already surpassed anyone in his age bracket in the, in the hierarchy of the Sanhedrin. He was already at a very young age for that kind of status. He was only about 40 years old or less when he accepted Christ, probably is in his mid-30s, that he had already gotten to the upper echelon of the Sanhedrin. And yet, as he pursued God, you see, in religion, you're working hard for God to accept you through your good deeds. And so Saul, who became Paul, was one of those who worked the hardest to, prove, to earn God's acceptance. But that is why he was the greatest sinner. Because, you see, God sees the religious person who is trying to be good enough for him to accept and ignoring his provision for our sins. He sees that person as worse than the drunk or the prostitute in the gutter. Because at least those people are, are not proudly trying to say, I am good enough for God to accept. But the religious person who is trying to come to God by his own efforts is saying, I don't need a blood sacrifice. I don't need someone to come die for me. I don't need you to give me forgiveness. I'll earn it myself. And that's what they're saying deep down in their heart before God. That's what he sees. They're treading underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet God is so holy that no man can ever by any amount of good works be good enough for him to accept. And Paul tried the hardest with his good works to become accepted. And so that's why it says here, again in verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Now what, look why Paul says he believes he was saved. Verse 16, And yet for this reason I found mercy, in order that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And here today, you may think that, well, if there is a God, I've just sinned so much, I'm beyond God's ability to, to reach. You may think God could never save me, and even if he did, I could never be, I could never hold out, I could never continue to be a Christian. If that's what you're thinking, look at Paul. God says he's the worst. And yet the worst sinner who has ever been on this earth has already been saved in order to demonstrate God has an answer for you today. God can save you where you are because Christ has died for every sin you'll ever commit. Not only those you've already committed, but the ones you haven't committed yet. Jesus Christ has already died for them. And he offers you here this morning a free pardon, a free forgiveness if you will by faith accept it. And that pardon brings with it Jesus himself who comes inside to dwell through the Holy Spirit. And he gives you the power to be different. Certainly none of us could hold out as a believer if it depended upon us. Even after we're a Christian and have a new nature that wants to follow God, you still don't have the power to live for Christ. None of us could hold out, but Jesus himself comes through the Holy Spirit 
and he not only gives us a new heart with new desires for him, but he gives us the power to fulfill those new desires. And that's what Paul is saying, I demonstrate. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I am the least of all the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle. Yet by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace did not prove vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. See, Paul never forgot that he was a sinner that had been saved by grace. And that's what true humility is. True humility is to realize that God has saved you apart from anything you'll ever do, apart from anything you can ever deserve, but not to downplay what God has made you. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He realized he had been made a new person, and by faith, he saw himself as this new creature that God had made him. Now back at Romans chapter 1. This was all wrapped up in his name. But you know, one of the favorite titles that Paul had, now here was a man who had achieved as much perhaps as anyone has ever achieved for Christ. And he could have been given many titles of honor. But you know what his favorite title was? Paul, a bond slave of Christ Jesus. That was his favorite title. Hey, listen, in the Roman world, they knew what that meant because half of the world was a bond slave to Rome. It meant that you, you were in a slavery from which you could never be released. You could never raise your own ransom. And so it meant that you were a slave to your master. And yet Paul says... Proudly, I am a bond slave of Christ. I belong to him. And I am joyfully his slave. Whatever he wants to do with my life, I am his bond slave. And that's an attitude that the Holy Spirit used to bring about the gospel to almost the whole Roman world through this one man because he saw himself as a bond slave. And then he says, set apart for the gospel of God. And this is in the perfect tense in the original Greek, which means he saw himself as having been set apart in the past with the results that he was set apart to God's gospel forever. And there is reflected here I, what I see is a very precious truth. Hold your place here and turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And that's how Jeremiah was called to the ministry. Well, the apostle Paul was called in a similar way, only more dramatic. Jesus Christ himself appeared to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus, going to slaughter more Christians there in Damascus. He had a commission from the high priest to go there. And while he was on the way, Jesus himself appeared to him. And it was Jesus who converted Paul to faith in himself. And so... Paul saw himself as set apart from the world to one thing, and that was to proclaim the good news of God. And that good news was that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life, to give life and forgiveness to the world. And so he saw himself as totally set apart to that from birth, from before the womb. 
That's a wonderful realization. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know that of yourself? To realize that God had set you apart from even before you were born to be his servant? To be set apart from all the frivolities of the world to the gospel of God, which will have eternal rewards? Well, let me tell you something. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, that is true of you. It's just as true of you as it was true of Paul. The problem is most of us don't realize it. Turn with me to John chapter 15, verse 16. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 16. And this is what Jesus says about all of us. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you accepted the gift of pardon he died to give you? then right now, God wants you to know, you didn't choose him, he chose you. And he ordained each one of us. For what? That we should go and bear much fruit. Now that's true of all of us. Because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in each one of us who have, has received Jesus into our life and accepted the gift of forgiveness. And he wants us to go forth, depending upon him, and bear much fruit. And how will we bear that fruit? Not by our own efforts, but by depending upon the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. We are ordained. God knew you before you were born. When you were being formed in the womb, God chose you. He knew who would believe from before the world was born. And he chose you. And he ordained you to go forth and bear much fruit. And he says that your fruit should remain. In other words, he says you will not only be successful, but what you do will remain forever because he will hold to it and you will be rewarded forever. You know that? Because every time we trust the Lord in this life, we're going to receive an eternal reward. And he says that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Isn't that a fantastic promise? He chose us. He ordained us. He has sent us forth to bear much fruit and the fruit we do produce will remain forever. And he says, here is your blank check as you go forth to serve me that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Isn't that fantastic? You are a chosen people. You are ordained. You are fully equipped to go forth and bear fruit. The Holy Spirit who dwells within you will give you all the power that you need. And of course, a large part of the meaning of that fruit is to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're in the last days of church history. You know, as I was looking through church history, Summarizing it last night, I realized after almost 2,000 years, we're almost at the end. All of the signs that indicate Christ coming is near are here. And we're at the very brink of Christ returning to take his church. That day is soon coming when each one of us will suddenly hear the voice of the Son of God and as we hear it in the next flash of, the, of our consciousness, we will be standing face to face with him. 
in glorified bodies that will never wear out. And we take our fruit with us. So I challenge you, dedicate yourself to learn his word so that we can together grow in a knowledge of the grace of God so that we with Paul can one day say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace did not prove empty with me. But his grace will supply all of the dedication and power we need to serve the Lord. We are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. He wants us to realize that. He gives us the freedom to choose otherwise. But he also tells us the only way we will ever be truly happy is to be a bond slave of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with Romans chapter 1 verse 1 again where it says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart, for the good news of God, literally. This morning, we want to talk about the good news of God. That is the theme of this whole epistle. What is God's good news? Well, as we will see in these next two verses, God's good news, the gospel, is a person. So look at verse 2. The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul wants us to know, as he wanted the original recipients, the Christians in Rome, to know that this good news of God was promised long before in the prophets. Now, why is that important? I came to believe the good news about Jesus Christ and to believe that this was not merely a work of men but it had to be a work of God, this book, because of prophecies about Jesus Christ that were fulfilled in his life, prophecies that were made about Jesus hundreds and hundreds of years before he was even born, prophecies that detailed what family he, uh, of what family he would be born, prophecies that told where he would be born, prophecies that told the general time of his birth, prophecies that told about the sort of things that he would do, prophecies that told about how he would be betrayed, and, uh, be betrayed and even the exact sum of money, silver, that would be paid for his betrayal. Prophecies that showed what would happen to the betrayer. Prophecies that told a thousand years before he was born and 800 years before crucifixion was even heard of that he would be crucified. Prophecies that told about the kind of miracles that he would perform. Prophecies that told about the purpose of his life and his death for us. In other words, everything was foretold, and Paul wants us to know that this good news, who is a person, was predicted in detail long before, and that those prophecies were all fulfilled. Why? So that we can have assurance that all of it is true. You see, one of the most distinctive things about Christianity that no other religion has is that it has thrown in the gauntlet of human awareness the proposition that there would be prophets who would make predictions and that all of their prophecies would have to come true 100 percent the first writing prophet moses in deuteronomy chapter 18 as he said there will be other prophets like me who will come to you and he says, you shall hearken to them. And he said, you will say in your heart, how shall we know the thing that the Lord has not said? He said, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come to pass, then that is what the Lord has not spoken. You shall not be afraid of him. And he had just said in the context, you shall stone him. 
there were a lot of rock piles in Israel because there were many false prophets who claimed to be speaking from God and the price of being wrong on one prophecy was very severe. They gave the life. And this is why the Jewish people, the Israelites, were willing to give their life to preserve in purity and accuracy this book. This is why even those, this book condemned their own kings and condemned them as a people and gave scathing indictments of the Israelites as a people. Even though it did that, they did not dare destroy the book because they knew it was authenticated as a message of God. When prophets would come on the scene and they would rake over the coals, the ruler, and they would indict them for being unbelievers and for being sinners, even a king would not dare destroy what the prophets wrote down because they knew it was the word of God. But most importantly was the theme about this coming Messiah who would be the Savior of the world. And so Paul wants us to know that all of these things were promised beforehand. So when we go back to Romans 1 now, that's the sort of thing that Paul is presenting to a skeptical Roman world. And he is saying that the gospel of God who is a person was promised beforehand through the holy prophets in the holy scripture. And he shows that this gospel that was promised is concerning God's son, concerning his son, who was born of a dis as a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now why was that important? Because the prophecy said he had to be the son of Abraham, a son of the tribe of Judah, and specifically a direct descendant of David. He had to have the regal right to the throne. And so that's why Paul says here, concerning his son who was born a descent of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now that's talking about his human nature. You see, in the one person of Jesus Christ, there are two natures, miraculously, and inseparably united in one person. Jesus is truly human and he's born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. But he has another nature in that person. What is that? He is the eternal second person of the Godhead. So you have undiminished deity and perfect humanity joined together inseparably in one person. And one of the greatest mysteries, one of the most profound things that we have to seek to understand about Jesus Christ is he's both God and man in one person. As you see Jesus walking through the Gospels and the things he said and did, he always said them and did them from the standpoint of one of two natures. When he spoke, he either spoke from his humanity or he spoke from his deity. Or sometimes he spoke from the whole person, the combination of the two. When he spoke of being Savior, he was speaking from his person, both natures. But when he said in, for instance, John 14, 26, he made the statement to his disciples, was sad when he said he was going to go away. He said, if you love me, you would rejoice that I said I would go away because I go to my Father and my Father is greater than than I am. Now, from what nature was he speaking? His human nature. Is the Father greater than his divine nature? Absolutely not. Jesus' divine nature is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. There are three persons who are absolutely equal and are one in their nature but in verse 4 we're introduced to his divine nature where it says who is declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that talks about his divine side and it shows that he was declared to be the Son of God, not merely a man, but equal with God. And he was declared to be that by the resurrection. Well, how does the resurrection prove that he's the Son of God? Well, all you have to do is read through the Gospels. And Jesus many times made the statement, like I and the Father are one essence. Well, the religious leaders understood exactly what he was claiming. They see, they took up stones to stone him because they said, you being a man are making yourself equal with God. And that's exactly what he was saying. In John chapter 5, where he said they challenged him because he was working on the Sabbath, and his answer was, my father works until now, and I am working. Now, what did he mean? Well, a father doesn't take a Sabbath rest and stop holding the universe together. And he says, and I do the same work. So Jesus said, I have the same sovereign right and the same sovereign power as God the Father. Just as he's working, holding all of the vast complex of the universe in orbit and in own time, split seconds accuracy holding all the molecules and atoms together so I'm holding them together now they understood something of what he was saying because once again they tried to kill him because they wanted to kill him for blasphemy because they said you make yourself equal with God instead of re saying no you're wrong he went on to say that's exactly what I'm saying because he said just as the father calls forth the dead and gives them life so the son does and so forth but all through the Gospels, Jesus made these claims and then just close to when he was to be put to death, he made several predictions. They asked for a sign and he said, I will give you a sign. And he said, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he shall, then he will be raised from the dead. And he said, that will be the sign that everything I have said is true. And that's in what sense Paul means here when he says he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. You see, Jesus staked everything upon the proposition that he would be raised from the dead bodily on the third day. If he had not been, then he said, everything I said is a lie. But he was willing to stake everything he stood for, everything he taught, everything he died for on the one prophecy that he would be raised from the dead on the third day. And he was, and therefore everything he said is true. You understand that? And so that's why this morning, if you're groping for where you stand with God, you don't know, you don't know you're forgiven. Right now you can say, I don't understand it all. But Jesus, I want you to come into my life and I accept the gift of pardon you purchased by dying in my place. If you're uncertain right now, pray this prayer. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me right now. Come into my life and forgive me. If you sincerely prayed that prayer, then right now you have eternal life. You have the gift of eternal life. And you'll not perish, but you have eternal life.